Guys, this is Mobin. We are talking about the pulmonology. This is the pathology of the obstructive lung diseases. The topic today is the asthma. Asthma is defined clinically as the proxismal, which means intermittent, proxismal, possibly allergic inflammation of the airways, which is accompanied by wheezing, cough, breathlessness and chest tightness mostly during the night or early morning. So that is the definition of the asthma. It is an obstructive disease. Patient normally experiences this when they are trying to exhale. So in that symptom, it is similar to emphysema and chronic bronchitis or, or COPD. How this is dissimilar from COPD is that it is reversible, mostly reversible. That means you can administer drugs and you can bring the airways back almost towards normal. In the chronic bronchitis or in emphysema, you cannot reverse them. You can stall and reduce the progress of those, but you cannot reverse them. Also, asthma is also chronic. COPD is also chronic. Now, asthma is primarily, it has three primary problems that you should see. So as we will do the pathogenesis here, what I would encourage you is to look at three problems. There is a triad of issues. What are those three issues? Number one, you have the airway, airway obstruction. Number two, you have smooth muscle what the patient has, smooth muscle hyperplasia, hyperplasia with hyperactivity, hyperactivity. And finally, patient has inflammation. These are the three basic pillars, three basic problems. So when you are looking at the pathogenesis or pathology of the asthma, you have to figure out how will you cause airway obstruction? How would you look at smooth muscle hyperplasia and hyperactivity, which is called the bronchospasm? And how would you cause inflammation? That is one. Secondly, asthma can be phasic. What that means is there is an immediate allergic reaction. Most of the time it is allergic. There is an immediate allergic reaction and then there is a late phase allergic reaction. So that means people may have an immediate asthma attack, become okay, and then a few hours later have a bigger attack which might go on for a, for a day or more. This is why asthma can actually be classified clinically as intermittent, which means about twice a week and it goes away within a few minutes. Or status asthmaticus, which is or chronic, which is more than twice a week, plus the duration, status asthmaticus is, the duration is more than a day. Now, the types of asthma from the trigger, the causes, the things that cause asthma, based on that, asthma is of two primary types. The two types, I'm going to write them here, are atopic or extrinsic and non-atopic or intrinsic. What does that mean? We, you know from our immunology lectures, Atopy means predisposition towards hyperreaction to normal allergens. Those things which most of the 80% of the population tolerates, there are 20% of the people who do not tolerate them and hyperreact towards them, react towards them, and that causes allergy. So atopic are those patients who have a familial inherited disposition 
towards reacting to normal allergens that is one. It is also called extrinsic because the patient has to be exposed to some external allergen that may be cat and dog dander or epithelium, it could be dust, it could be pollen and so on. In, in US at least pollen based asthma is very common so people when the spring comes they, they become really anxious because as soon as they go out there is pollen and they start having problems. Now non atopic asthma is an asthma which is not allergenic. So there is nothing from outside that is causing it, there is something inside that is causing the problem. Normally it is a smaller set of people that has this problem and what happens is there are multiple causes that can cause this. Most important in there is drug related especially the aspirin and we will talk about the mechanism of action here. Then exercise, stress, cold, then occupational occupational toxins, for example, tolines and other such things. So these are the intrinsic type of the asthma or non atopic. There is nothing and the patient is not actually hyperallergenic. Patient you do not see the, the, the signs and symptoms and you do not see if you do the test you do not see the patient to be hyperreactive. Even then the patient has somehow reaction to some things that causes the bronchospasm. So keep these two in mind and let us now start to the pathogenesis. So pathogenesis is very simple, uh, first let me just make use this space here and I am going to make very quickly, so let us say this is the respiratory epithelium which is shown here this is the respiratory epithelium that is presented here normally pseudo stratified tall columnar ciliated cells. Then underneath those cells is the basement membrane. So all epithelial cells sit on the basement membrane so that is there. Below the basement membrane is the lamina propria. Lamina propria normally contains a few cells, some goblet cells and then mostly collagen and fibrin, you know, the elastic fibers. These are the fibers that give the recoil or elasticity to the respiratory tree. So that is there and then underneath, so this whole thing is called mucosa up to the muscular layer. layer. So epithelium, basement membrane, lamina propria together is a mucosa, then is the mus muscle layer which sits between the mucosa and submucosa. It is not part of mucosa and it is not part of the submucosa, it is actually between them. Then below that is the submucosa and submucosa contains glands. And normally these, these are just sufficient glands to produce mucus or zero mucus secretions that would come all the way to the surface here and trap the antigens that are coming in. That is the normal function. So here there will be muscle layer and after the muscle layer there will be the glandular layer. And after the glandular layer there is just some adventitia that may have arteries, nerves and veins. So that is a normal structure. And based on where you take the slice in the respiratory tree, there may or may not be cartilages present. So what we have done is we have taken one section of this wall and expanded it here. So you are seeing one part of it. So here we are seeing the epithelium, this side is a lumen, so ideally this wall will actually become closed and here is a lumen. Now let us see how the pathogenesis would occur. This is the atopic or allergy type asthma which is the most common type. So this, these are the epitheliums. What are you, we going to see here? Number one we have these pseudo stratified cells. Why? Because there are some, uh, some cells which are just going to give rise to other cells but they themselves are not ciliated and they are not functioning. They are stem cells. Then keep an eye on this cell as well. This is a dendritic cell. 
dendritic cell. There are there are mast cells sitting here as well. And then of course there is small thin layer of mucus that is secreted by these mucus glands. So these glands would secrete mucus and that would go there, serum mucus. There may be goblet cells here which would produce some uh, secretion as well, but that is the basic structure here. Under the epithelium is the, as I said before, elastic fibers. In this space, there may be some helper cells, some mast cells, some B cells, so some immune related cells. Below that is the muscles and then is the submucosa which contains the glands and then of course the blood vessels and arteries and nerves coming from the adventitia. So that is the structure. What do we have over here? This is a vagus nerve. So under the epithelium, we have vagus subepithelial receptors. These are efferents, that means they take the signals away. So they would take the signals from the respiratory center to, to the, sorry, from the respiratory airways to the center and then bring the efferents back. The vagus efferents release acetylcholine onto the bronchial muscles. This is an important thing from pharmacological point of view. When you are treating asthma, you will do something here. So what happens is when vagus efferent comes in and releases the acetylcholine, what would that do? That causes the contraction of the smooth muscles. So vagus would actually or parasympathetic activity would actually cause narrowing of the airway. So if you blocked it, that would cause the dilatation of the airways. Now on the beta 2 side, what happens is that the, the respiratory airways do not have a lots of sympathetic innervation. However, they do have beta 2 receptors present here and when these receptors are stimulated, that would cause relaxation of the bronchial muscles and so the bronchial or bronchi, they will open up, the airways will open up. That is why in the treatment of asthma, we start with the short acting beta agonists or sabas and as if the patient has a, the, the disease is advanced and this short acting beta agonists are not working, then you give them steroids with long acting beta agonists. So this is also very important. Normally we, we can give acetylcholine blockers, but antagonists for acetylcholine would have other many other effects as well which we do not want, so not really used. Okay, so now let's start with the pathogenesis. Here is what happens. Let's say the first wave, the patient for the very first time in the childhood became exposed to some allergen. That allergen is here. So let's say this is a pollen. The patient is, is allergic to some pollen. That pollen comes and gets trapped by the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell is going to eat up parts of the antigen and then it's going to digest them, break them up and finally what would happen is it's going to send them inside. When it sends them into the lamina propria, these are going to be picked up on the T cell receptors. So keep this in mind, T helper 2 are the primary player in asthma as are the eosinophils. That is the primary difference between the chronic bronchitis and asthma. Chronic bronchitis does not have eosinophils and asthma does have eosinophils. Just like chronic bronchitis is not reversible and asthma is reversible. All right, so the, the antigen comes in here, is lodged on the T cell receptor. T cell then processes this and in result, it releases interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. It also releases interleukin-13, but let's stick with the 4 and 5 for the time being. Now interleukin-4 acts on the B cell and what does it do? It causes the B cell to class switch to start producing IgEs. Remember 4E, I did that in immunology lectures, a small mnemonic. So anyways, B cell would convert into plasma cell, become an active cell and start producing IgEs. These IgEs will become lodged, they will become stuck on the mast cell. So mast cell have Remember they have FC receptors where the IgE immunoglobulin will become connected 
So the same IgE will also go out and become lodged here on the mast cell. So here is the IgE and it would get lodged here as well. So all the mast cells in the airways are now primed with the IgE that would react to the antigens present in this pollen. Got it? Now this is the setup. First wave, first time patient ever got exposed to the antigen. The wave of the antigen came in again, patient went out for a, for a, a walk with the parents, it's a child and got exposed to the same pollen again or same antigen, dander, dog, cat, whatever, dust. The next time when this antigen came in, this time mast cells are already primed, so the antigen got stuck onto the mast cell and short-circuited two of the IgEs. Right? So we've done that in the past as well in the immunology lectures. So now we've gotten the epithelial mast cells that have become active and we've gotten the lamina propria mast cells that have become active. Now we are going to start the immediate reaction. So let's start from this side and go this way. First of all, the mast cells that are sitting on the epithelial, once they become activated, they're going to start releasing their mediators. What kind of mediators? They release prostaglandins, they release leukotrienes, they release interleukins and so on. So that many, many um, inflammatory cytokines are released. One function, so write it down somewhere. Function number one, the epithelial mast cell, when they release the cytokines, these cytokines kind of open up the gaps between the epithelial cells. So they kind of push the cells away that allow them to create a gap. From this gap, these antigens can actually now go in the lamina propria. These antigens are also going to act or bind on the vagus afferent as well. Sub-epithelial vagus afferent would become directly connected to the antigen because of the junctions opening up because of mast cell cytokines. Okay, so when that happens, vagus afferent would bring the message back to its centers and there would be local and central reflexes and that would cause the vagus efferent to become activated. When that would become activated, bronchial constriction would occur because the muscles would contract. Remember this, that triad that we talked about, airway obstruction, smooth muscle hyperactivity or bronchospasm and inflammation, these are the three things that are going to happen that would cause asthma. So here you are seeing one thing happening, smooth muscle reaction through the nervous system by direct activity of the antigen. Got it? So that's one. Now come back here. Second thing, so the allergen had come in, it made the mast cell active. What will mast cell do? Number one, it will send some chemoattractants for neutrophils. I'm going to make neutrophils like this and for eosinophils. And please remember, for us, the primary player in the asthma is eosinophil. So we are very, very much interested to understand how eosinophil would become active. So here you are seeing that immediate reaction to the allergen is also setting up a late phase reaction. Eosinophil is responsible for late phase. So mast cell is calling the eosinophils to come in. Got it? Hold on to that thought. Now this mast cell also would re release leukotriene B4, C4, actually C4, D4 and E4, right? So this is the arachidonic acid path pathway for the inflammation. So one is the lipooxygenase path pathway and the other one is cyclooxygenase pathway. So lipooxygenase pathway would get us these leukotrienes. These leukotrienes in turn will do three things. What are the three things? This is the triad, right? So number one, these would work on the smooth muscles and cause constriction of the smooth muscle. So bronco 
constriction will occur that is one function. What other function do we want edema, do we want inflammation, do we want airway obstructed, yes. So, act on the blood vessels, these would act on the blood vessels and cause blood vessels to dilate and more fluids would come out that would cause edema. That edema would cause the wall to swell up and the airway passage to become narrow. So, that is two. Third thing what it would do again see we are causing inflammation airway obstruction. So, we will cause the glands mucus glands to become hyperactive or we will stimulate the mucus glands. Mucus glands in turn when they are stimulated they will produce a lots of mucus. This mucus that they have produced what would it do? It would go all the way up and sit here now. So, now the patient has blobs of mucus present in the airway. So, if you come back here for a second, now if there is more mucus than normal, then what do you think? Will the airway become obstructed? Yes. Will the airway become narrowed? Yes. So, now the place is lesser and in the smaller airways when this mucus is present, it is possible that the whole airway just clogs up. This hyperactivity of the blood vessels, would that cause edema in this wall? Yes. Would that cause narrowing of the lumen? Yes. This hyperactivity of the bronchial smooth muscles, would that cause narrowing of the lumen? Yes. So, that triad has become active by leukotrienes from the mast cells. Now, I am going to go back here mast cell also release. So, this was a cyclooxygenase path sorry lipooxygenase pathway. Their cyclooxygenase pathway is also activated. It is arachidonic acid pathway. So, they would also create prostaglandins. So, PGD2 is especially important PGD2 prostaglandin D2 that has similar effect, but more importantly it would have effect on the glands and the muscle what would be the effect? Same effect as leukotrienes, bronchoconstriction and more mucus secretion by the glands. Got it? So, that is the immediate reaction. What else would happen? It is called the neutrophils in. So, neutrophils would also start releasing their inflammatory uh, chemical substances and the inflammation would just start going on. This is the immediate reaction to the allergen. Got it? Now, let us move on and see what is a late reaction. So, if I make a little line over here. So, this was the immediate reaction. Let us say late phase. Late phase normally a few hours later and it continues about 12, 24 hours or even more than that. That would be caused, if that happens, that would be caused status asthmaticus. Now, what happens is eosinophils are called in. Remember I talked that there will be IL-5 released as well. This IL-5 would help activate the eosinophils. The same way mast cells also produced IL-5. So, IL-5 will activate the eosinophils. What will eosinophil do in turn? Eosinophils would release major basic protein, major basic protein. Remember, these are eosinophilic. Then, the uh, other proteins that are going to be damaging, for example, cationic, cationic proteins. Then, they also produce the other inflammatory pathway proteins. However, this is important that these two proteins that are produced, these proteins will go up to the respiratory epithelium. So, if I make the epithelium over here, this respiratory epithelium, they look like foot. <laughs> they are, they are destructive to that epithelium. So, what would that cause? The epithelium damage would start. So, that is one. So, epithelial damage which in turn will cause inflammation to start. 
because there is cell damage. Plus, it would also release the inflammatory substances that would go and do the same thing as leukotrienes were doing. Number one, increase the vascular dilatation. Number two, cause the mucus secretion. And number three, cause the bronchoconstriction those three things would happen again. But this is a late phase and this would continue for 24 hours or more. These guys, once they have become activated, once they have been arriving, they do not need antigen anymore. So, the patient does not have to be exposed to antigen for two days. Patient went out for a walk, came back in, had the immediate reaction started, which caused the late phase reaction started. Once the late phase reaction is started, you do not need antigens here. Eosinophil is not sitting here saying, fine, give me the antigen and then it will work. No, that is not going to happen. It just becomes triggered and that is what is the status asthmaticus. Cool. So, now we have gotten the activity happening in both cases. So, this is the pathogenesis for the atopic type. Now, the non-atopic really is very simple. We do not actually know exact mechanism for how the non-atopic type just cause asthma. But there is some, um, there is some speculation that the infections, viral infections can cause the, this, this whole inflammatory system to become hyper reactive. And then on top of that, when you put some other stresses like cold and exercise and environmental stress uh, things, that then triggers the asthma. But in this one, the one that is really important for, for us to understand, because it can be in the tests as well, is the aspirin related asthma. So, what happens is that aspirin, what it does is, you know that it blocks inflammation by blocking the cyclooxygenase pathway. So, when the cyclooxygenase pathway is blocked, what would happen is, this prostaglandin production is reduced, yes, but lipooxygenase pathway can become imbalancedly, Im imbalanced and become triggered and leukotrienes can become activated. And when leukotrienes are produced more and they are active, not activated, produced more, they would cause this bronchospasm. So, that is aspirin related bronchospasm or asthma. So, once the patient knows that aspirin causes that, then they should stop using it. Okay, so that is the atopic asthma. Uh, one more thing that is important is to understand is airway remodeling, airway remodeling. So, look, the whole airway, if you go from inner layer, the lumen side, all the way down, there are changes. Lumen has more mucus in it, mucus plugs are present. If you take the morphological picture of that, you would actually see the something that is called Kirschman spirals. What are these? The strings of epithelial cells are detached and are trapped in the mucus. And so, you would see long, long threads of epithelial cells stuck in the mucus and kind of making spirals thick, sticky th spirals. So, that is, these are the Kirschman spirals. With those, those spirals, you might see charcoal laden um, crystals, which are the crystals of eosinophil cells and their proteins. So, these are the Kirschman spirals, C U R S C H, Kirschman spirals. And charcoat laden crystals. So, that is what you see. So, that is the change here. Narrowing is present. Then as you start coming down here, what you would see is lamina propria would become thick. Thick with what? With the more and more elastic and collagen laid in here. Where did that come from? It, it is postulated that the mast cells, when they release their, uh, their cytokines and chemical substances, one effect of those chemical substances is to transcribe the genes in the cells, in the fibroblasts, to create more and more collagen. So, there is thick lamina propria. Then, the, the muscular layer, there is hyperplasia of the muscles. So, I am just going to make it in one place. So, the muscle layer becomes very, very thick as well. And again, these are, I think these are ADAM33 genes that become opened up. 
because of the mast cell activity and that cause more and more um, smooth muscle formation. So that is called the airway remodeling that the layers have become thick and big and they have become hyper reactive. Again remember this is a reversible situation. Now finally let us talk a little bit about clinical as well. We are doing this for step 1, this is not step 2 but clinically what happens is that the patient has the attacks of wheezing and breathlessness and chest tightness and these attacks normally go away within a few minutes or hours. It is a horrible feeling though because the breathlessness is present and patient feels trapped and claustrophobic. Uh, so it is more of a clinical thing than a fatal thing. However, status asthmaticus where the patient cannot breathe for days, more than one day or 24 hours, in that case patient is of course claustrophobic and anxious. In addition to that, there is carbon dioxide trapped in the body. So hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis can occur which can cause death. However, death with the asthma and status asthmaticus is less common. More common is the, the debilitation and the anxiety and the nervousness of the patient than the fatalities that are encountered. So that is a clinical course. On the, on the treatment of this, normally you start with the SABAs, short acting bronchial, uh, beta, <laughs> bronchial agonist, beta agonists and then if that does not handle the situation, then you add some steroids as well which are anti-inflammatory. That is the second stage. If that does not work, then you add long acting beta agonists with the uh, steroids that is the third and fourth then you add the uh, you know prostaglandin receptor blockers and so on and I have actually there is a there is a nice doctor here who does the I think he calls it um, bronchial uh, thermoplasty. So what he does is he inserts a catheter in the airways and kind of gives a heat therapy to these muscles and he relaxes the muscles. So it does three or four sessions after every three months and that uh, three weeks and that causes a relaxation and the patients with the severe asthma actually feel much much better and are uh, happy. So that is also a newer way of uh, treating this. So that is asthma. Thank you very much.